So this is our 10th screencast-ish. It's quite a nice round number, isn't it? Uh, now we're going to get into something a bit more about collision rates, building on a little bit of things we know previously about speed. So we know that the speed of the molecule obviously imparts a bit of energy to something to get to the activation energy, go over the activation barrier and so on. But it also has an effect on the number of collisions that could possibly happen. And for this, we really need to focus down on what a molecule sees and then where's it moving so that means going to collision cross section messing around with our speeds a little bit to have relative speeds and then figure out something called the collision rate so that collision rate um is helpful so just once again we are building on things so once we define collision cross section and relative speeds for instance the collision rate comes from putting these two things together because Obviously, the size of a molecule will depend, will influence the number of collisions. The speed that the molecule is moving will influence the number of collisions. So we obviously get that from the previous two. So keep that in mind whilst we're going through some of this. Uh, first of all, let's talk about collision cross-section. So collision cross-section is effectively defined as an area of a sphere or circle. And you might be thinking, that's a bit weird. Um, molecules aren't spherical are they oh you'd be right they absolutely are but they do tumble around a lot so a molecule like this could actually tumble in all sorts of different areas uh, in different orientations and as it tumbles through and moves through a solvent or moves through a gas uh, its orientation will change so kind of on average uh, a collision could be considered spherical because that orientation of the molecule is utterly random uh, so on average this doesn't necessarily say that our cross-section is exactly literally like I've drawn here uh, that says uh, it must be a sphere that encompasses the entire molecule. Uh, it just means that it can kind of average down to a sphere. Um, but to kind of get the link across, I'm going to just draw the molecule in there. So if this thing tumbling around, uh, its sort of average look as it's smeared out uh, would be roughly spherical. So here's a sphere and it obviously has things like a radius... It obviously has a diameter, it has a circumference and so on. Um, so if we're dealing with this kind of thing, you might expect pi to start appearing and so on. So let's have a look at what collision cross-section does. Uh, so here's our molecule. It is surrounded by this sphere that we are modeling it as. So it doesn't matter what the molecule is, we're just gonna pretend it's a sphere. And when it goes forward through a load of other molecules that it could collide with, it hits some. So there you go, it hits three, it flies off there, and it has missed three of them and it has hit three of them. So as you can see, the ones that are really halfway into this kind of, this tube here, uh, it sort of means that the molecule is sweeping out uh, sort of a tube shape or cylindrical shaped area as it passes through these gases. So anything inside that, is hit, all well, things aren't. So this comes across to our definition called collision diameter. So this is obviously the collision diameter, and we give it D as a label. And that is equal to the two colliding objects as radiuses added together, or R1 plus R2. That's probably an overly formal way of dealing with it. It gets us this diameter. And then we want to get the collision cross-section, which is defined by sigma. So once again, we we do run out of Greek letters very, very quickly, uh, almost as fast as we run out of Latin letters. So collision cross-section in this case is also sigma, uh, in addition to everything else that sigma signifies. Uh, so this pi d squared is an area, and it is this area. It is slightly outside the radius of this. So it's not defined as the radius of one molecule, it's defined as the radius of two of them added together. So if we had another molecule here, you know, its center is outside of that dotted red line. It is, that, di that distance between them is greater than D, the collision diameter. So this is how we define it. It's gotta be this R1 plus R2 kind of thing going on. So let's just really quickly review that. It was a very quick one, wasn't it? Uh, collision diameter, defined by adding the average radius of molecules together, 
the cross section is from squaring the collision diameter and multiplying by pi. So that's just getting a circle. So it is a circle. It is an area. Um, and then the number of collisions is going to depend on this cross section and the speed of the molecule. And this is what we're going to get onto next. So let's have a look at relative speeds. Relative speed is what we're interested in, in this case. Uh, we've defined kind of root mean squared speed and some other uh, speeds. Here we're just interested in relative. So we've got C that's our average root mean squared speed. Uh, kind of the average speed independent of direction here. Uh, and we want a relative speed of collision because actually if two molecules are kind of coming very closely to each other, you know, one's going slowly and the other one's just coming gently, that relative speed is kind of small. If they're coming head to head with each other, it's much, much faster. So here in this case, we clearly have 2C. This is coming forward at speed C. This is coming forward at speed C. They're going to hit. Uh, this, if, you know, they're almost not going to touch each other, or at least if they do, it'd be very glancing. Uh, and we can also work it out by sort of a collision thing here. So this is just straightforward Pythagoras theorem. If that's C there, that's a square root of the other side summed together. So uh, it's all right to kind of leave it there for now. We're just interested in kind of a sort of a relative speed. And we calculate it using more like this equation. So root eight, Boltzmann constant of temperature, pi mu. Okay, so where does that mu come from? You may have come across it before, uh, but I want to just spend some time on that. And this mu is the reduced mass. So this pops up all the time in physics, especially in spectroscopy. And when you're interacting two bodies together, uh, reduced mass is really, really useful because um, it means Effectively, you only need to use one number for the mass of something. If you have two objects interacting with each other, you can have a reduced mass. You can just combine them together. Uh, and you can also kind of give them a center of mass as well. So even though this diagram here is like two things rotating around each other, you can treat it as one thing and then you can solve it perfectly. So reduced mass is really, really useful. Um, and it's this equation, MA by MB, MA plus MB. Uh, now, if you often forget which way around that goes, one is multiplied, one is I, uh, added, you might get confused and think that maybe it's this at some point. Uh, again, follow, I'll write the data again, uh, M, B, you might think it's that way around, but think of the units here. Reduced mass is a mass, so it can't be this because we have a mass squared at the top, and this, well, they add, so that must be mass. So they are now cancelling out what we have, the mass. It doesn't matter what these units are, we just need to know that the dimensions cancel down. So do not get bogged down with it thinking, oh, is it the equation this way or the other way? Work out the units. Um, honestly, like so much of physical chemistry, if you just look at the units. Uh, if you know the consequences of the whole reduced mass concept, if the masses are very similar, uh, Reduced mass is about half of what each of the individual values is. You, I mean, you can work this out. Imagine 20 times 20 divided by 40. Uh, oof, what is that? Like 400 divided by 40 is equal to uh, 10. So, uh, and then imagine something like a thousand times one on the top divided by a thousand plus one. You can kind of see that that's like a thousand over a thousand. It's equal to one. Uh, roughly equal to oops, zero, uh, equal to one. So the reduced mass is when there's a big discrepancy in masses is roughly approximate to the smaller unit. Uh, that approximation will come in really useful when you do a bit more physics because think of the atom for a moment. Uh, a single electron is about two thousand um, two thousand times smaller than the mass of uh, the nucleus. Well, the nucleus is about 2,000 times heavier. Uh, so you can use the reduced mass of a proton and an electron, or you can use the uh, just the mass of the electron. They approximate to very similar things. Uh, so reduced mass gets used a lot in physics. It's really, really useful. So do get used to this equation. Um, it's what we obviously want for the relative speeds. And it pops up so often that it is really worth getting to grips with if you haven't already. So let's just review that bit. Um, I like doing these mini reviews in the middle. 
we are interested in the relative speeds of molecules um, because they can combine together or cancel. So, yeah, pointing together, that's obviously it's higher than the rel than the, just the normal speed. If they're kind of glancing, their collision speed is slightly less. So we're interested in more the relative speeds of each of the molecules. And we calculate that using a reduced mass of the two things together. So we have object A, object B colliding with each other. We can, from their reduced mass and a few other bits of calculation, get their relative speeds. So that's one of the other measures of speed that we are interested in in this case. And now collision rate per second. So we'll go back to this diagram. We have one two, three, well, that's three collisions in a couple of seconds. So what you can probably tell us if it moved faster than the rate per second would increase uh, and if it was, uh, so here I'm gonna speed it up. Here's the relative collision speed going up. There you go, much faster. You've, hopefully the uh, sound ref, um, recorded the clicks as well there. Uh, but if we increase the density, go back down to the same original relative speed, we can hear it go off. There we go. Much higher collision speed, so or collision frequency. Sorry. So we have got two factors that come into this: the relative speeds and the density, in addition to the cross section. So we've looked a little bit at this so far. We figured out what the cross section is. We also had a look at what relative speed was, and we can work out density based on. Uh, partial pressures and a little bit of the ideal gas equation. So what we get is a much bigger um, much bigger equation here, but it is still just the three things multiplied together. Don't be bogged down by the fact that this looks really huge. Um, this is just working out our average speed. This is just working out the collision diameter. Uh, and this is working out partial pressures. So this is starting to become something closer to a microscopic justification for why things go at a certain rate. If there's more of them, physically more of them, that density increases, the rate goes up. If they're moving faster, that increases, the rate goes up. And if their cross-sectional collisional area goes up, the number of collisions also increases. So we do have a few more things to bolt onto this, uh, sterics in particular. Uh, but for now, let's just go back over this and review all those three points again. So we did collision cross-section. That is, if we have a molecule A, then its actual cross-sectional area is a little bit outside it, and it's based on the radius of whatever else it's um, colliding with. I'll redraw that one and make it actually look like it's the right size for that. There we go. That is B. Its centre has to cross this line. So the area is a little bit outside the mean diameters of each. Uh, and the relative speeds, so that C rel is what we're interested in because head-on collisions are going to be slightly faster than glancing ones. So we really want to kind of get an average of that speed, not one of the root mean squared speeds of all the molecules involved. And our collision rate therefore depends on that cross-section the relative speed and obviously the density which comes from partial pressure so multiplying all those factors together gets us our collision rate constant our collision rate at least uh, so that's it for this one we'll do a little bit more on this in the next screencast uh, there's a little bit more detail we need to do including mean free path and a few others um, but we're nearly at the end of this whole microscopic kinetic theory of gases uh, section so mm -hmm.